Good afternoon. It's good to be back to give the second lecture in this course. I thought I'd uh, start by giving a brief recap of what we covered last time before picking up where we left off on the hypothesis testing. Okay, so back on the first, first set of slides. We started off by talking about some of the fundamentals of probability. Um, we introduced this concept of the probability triple or probability space um, with the three components that we talked about. The omega, the space of random outcomes, and then we have this sigma algebra, F, and then we have our probability measure, P. Okay. And then we talked about some of the prob probability axioms uh, that, were, that, we, that we laid out uh, to build on. Uh, and the interpretation of probability in terms of a proportion of chance of, of, of occurrence of events um, and compound events. Okay. Then we extended this idea of uh, the probability triple to the notion of conditional probability, which is key to many of our applications where we want to consider what's the probability of event B given that event A happens also. And this leads nicely to Bayes' theorem, which is central to all of machine learning and um, any kind of statistical analysis in a, in a practical setting. So we have a probability of y given x equals this, probability of x given y multiplied by probability of y and then uh, normalized by the evidence, probability of x. Okay, so we can keep that in mind. Then we discussed some properties of random variables uh, in terms of the expectation and the variance and uh, various properties of, of this. I'm not going to go over that in detail, but let's skip that. And then we, we come to this, this crucial uh, point of statistical inference, which was what the core part of the course. So we want to use our sample data to say things to draw conclusions or make decisions about the population or make a decision regarding what action we should take. Okay. Uh, then we, we highlighted the importance of random sampling and what it means for a sample to be random. Uh, so a common assumption when performing statistical modeling is to assume IID, so independent and identically distributed uh, sequence of random variables. So that, that's key um, in, in this setting. Then we started to talk about estimators of parameters. So when we're carrying out statistical modeling, um, we want to estimate a parameter, say a normal model, we want to estimate the mean and the variance. Um, but what, what properties of the estimators are important? So we highlighted three properties. So firstly is unbiasedness, which means that the expectation of our estimator should be equal to the population uh, parameter, so on average. So this, this is a very important uh, es uh, property of the estimator. And then the second important property we introduced was efficiency, which is the idea of the variance of the estimator uh, being the minimum amongst the sets of possible estimators we can consider. So, for example, the sample mean uh, is, can be shown to have the minimum variance across the mean. So we say it's efficient. And if we take this idea of variance of estimators even further, we come to the third aspect of uh, an estimator property, which is desirable, which is consistency, which states that as we gather more and more data, so n tends to infinity, we should have that the variance tends to zero, which for the sample mean, we have this property. You see the sample mean variant, the variance of the sample mean is uh, 
sigma squared over n, so clearly this tends to zero. Whereas if we consider some other naive choices of uh, estimator for the sample mean, then we see that these don't tend to zero in the variance. Okay. So we see the sample means pretty good estimator to use in general. Okay. Then we, we talked about this idea of a confidence interval uh, to extend the approach of just having a point estimate of our parameter to have an interval where we can say with 95% confidence the parameter of the, pop the population parameter lies in this interval. So perhaps, the, well, this gives us more, more idea of, if we just have a point estimator, we, we don't have uh, a solid understanding of how, how much we should trust this estimate or not. So th this is why we started talking about confidence intervals. And this idea of confidence intervals extends nicely to this topic of hypothesis testing. So we go to the second set of slides. OK. So we started talking about hypothesis testing. We introduced this example of a paint manufacturer who is claiming that this new fast drying paint on average dries in 20 minutes. Okay, so that's their claim. And we want to empirically test this, this claim. So uh, a member of staff was instructed to paint 36 uh, fence panels and record the drying time of each and then test this claim of average drying time of 20, 20 minutes. Okay. Okay, so our data set here, our X, consists of the drying times for 36 uh, fence panels. So say, for example, these are our drying times. Okay, so this is our data sample. Uh, so if we plot this on here, so the, the claim drying to average drying time is 20. And then we collect our data sample of 36. So n is 36 here. So perhaps, say, say this is our data sample x. So if we plot a histogram of this, so actually in this example, the empirical, the sample mean was 20.75. So, so perhaps we have some kind of distribution like this. Let's pretend that's roughly normal. And we want to test whether this claimed mean value of 20, is that true or is it not true? Okay, so we, so we want to carry out a hypothesis test. Okay, yeah. So we have the null hypothesis that mu equals 20. And we either want to uh, test a one-sided test or a two-sided test. So maybe I've already got this here. Okay, yeah. So we can either have an alternative hypothesis of mu is not equal to 20, which is a two-sided test, or we can test specifically one tail of the distribution. So we can say mu is greater than 20. So in this example, we want to test whether the manufacturer is uh, being a bit uh, overselling their products a little bit. So we just look at the right tail. So mu is greater than 20. Okay. So this is a one-sided test. OK. OK. Then we talked about this idea of errors. So type 1 error and a type 2 error. 
So these, these errors are kind of trading off these errors. The probability of these errors is crucial in any, any kind of hypothesis test, where we have a, a type 1 error being rejecting the null hypothesis when, in fact, it's actually true, as type 2 errors failing to reject H0 when it's false. So the probabilities of A and B are assigned to these is the normal notation. And a power of a test is 1 minus beta. So this is rejecting H0 when it's false. So if a test is powerful, then we're expecting this to be close to 1. OK, so that's where we want. But OK, yeah. So perhaps, de depending on what kind of empirical testing or hypothesis testing you're carrying out, will determine how important alpha and beta are. So, for so the origins of these tests are in court trials, whereas where you, you don't particularly want to convict an innocent person. That's a crucial point, innocent until proven guilty. So here, alpha is going to be of the utmost important importance. So you want to cap alpha, and then beta, the beta consideration is secondary. But maybe this isn't the case in, in every example. OK. So it, then we looked at these calculating probabilities of these type 1 errors and type 2 errors, uh, where we use this idea of a, a Z score, which is just a standardization um, of the sample mean using mu. And here we assume a known variance. OK. Let me skip through some of this. OK. And then we come to this idea of a p-value, which is crucial in hypothesis testing. So the p-value is the smallest level of significance that would lead to rejection of the null given this sample that we've collected. So essentially what this is saying is the chance of being wrong if we reject H0. So we want this to be small, of course. Okay. So to calculate the p value for our, our data sample, um, we, we, this is uh, equal to the probability that our sample mean lies outside of this confidence interval that we calculate where we just plug in these standardized scores for Z0. Um, so we, we covered up to here last time. I think we, we started to talk about um, when we don't know the variance, which of course is the case in, in practice. So we have to estimate the variance as well, the standard deviation, sigma. So we have S. OK, so we come to this point. So we plug in our, from our sample, we can calculate this S value. And then we just plug this on the denominator for the T statistic, which was the Z statistic. So now we have a, a T statistic. So we have to use uh, the T distribution with N minus 1 degrees of freedom. So N here is the number of data points. Okay. So this is just a, 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 similar to the normal distribution tables, we just look up T distribution tables with that, with N minus one degrees of freedom. OK. OK. So we have this calculated T zero, which has an S on the denominator. OK, so this is where we got up to last time. So what if the population isn't, in fact, normally distributed? Then we can appeal back to this central limit theorem that we introduced last time, which essentially gives us that if we calculate this statistic, then even if the population isn't normal, then this statistic is still going to be approximately normally distributed. 
and the more data samples we collect, the closer to normal this will be. And similarly, if we plug in for the S for the standard deviation. Okay, so two approximations there, so less, less close to normal, but it doesn't dramatically affect our result here. Okay, so we come to these tests where we have one-sided tests and two-sided tests. And we have what we now call approximate significant levels and approximate p-values since we don't have normal distributions. And we're inputting uh, an approximation of the standard deviation through the sample variance, sample standard deviation. Okay. So we have this, reject the null if it's outside this confidence interval. Okay, so that was for the sample mean. Now we can extend this uh, technique to think about other population parameters, such as the variance would be the next candidate for consideration. But also, once we calculate the variance, we can use this to uh, make inferences about other parameters in, in distributions or about the population. Okay. So here we see where this denominator of n minus 1 comes from. Okay. So we see this sample variance here, as, uh, as you'll be familiar with. It's 1 over n minus 1 uh, pre-multiplier. So if we work, th work through where this comes from, it's quite useful. So if we, if we write out here, that if we ex uh, work through this expression, we can write this xi minus x bar squared. If we just expand that out, we have this expression. And then if we plug in this sum over n, then we follow through some algebra, then it drops out to be this expression here in the bottom right. So sum of xi minus mu squared and then n lots of x bar minus mu squared. Okay. So we know that the variance of xi is equal to this expression, expectation of xi minus mu squared, which equals sigma squared. And we also know from our, sam from our sampling distribution that the variance of x bar, our sample mean, is equal to sigma squared over n. So if we plug all of this into what we had earlier, and then we have the, this expectation here is equal to n sigma squared, and then just plug this in. So we get this equals n minus one lots of sigma squared. So we can see that the expectation of s squared that we had before is equal to n minus 1 sigma squared over n minus 1, so sigma squared. So this means that our s squared, as we define it here, is an unbiased estimate, and this is why we use it. So if we used uh, just a 1 over n in the s squared, then it would be a biased estimator of the variance. Okay, so it's useful to see the intuition behind why there's an n minus one there, which may seem strange. Okay, but we have to be careful, of course, because the expectation of x squared is not equal to the expectation of x squared. So when we start to think about standard deviations, so the expectation of the standard deviation is not equal to the, pop is not equal to the population standard deviation. So it's a bias estimator in the standard deviation, but not in the variance. Okay. That's useful to remember. Okay. Now we want to think about the distribution of S squared. Now S squared is the sample variance. So of course it can't be negative because there's a square in, in, the, in the term there. So we shouldn't be expecting it to be a normal distribution because it's positive, always positive. Well, it can't be negative, so 
greater than or equal to zero. And in fact, in general, as making no assumptions, we can't say very much about the sample, sampling distribution of S squared. But however, if we assume that the population is normal, or we know that the population is normal, it's an assumption, then we can say that the sampling distribution of S squared uh, can be derived to be what's called a chi-squared distribution. So here we see that if we have this sample x with mean mu and variance sigma squared, then n minus 1 of s squared over sigma squared is distributed as this chi-squared with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. OK. Where the probability density function of this chi-squared is given here. So let's just have a look at this. So we have this, this term here is the gamma function, which is defined down here. Uh, and this, so this gamma function, when we consider integers, uh, is given by this gamma of n equals n minus 1 factorial. But, OK, so this is the gamma function. Maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't. Uh, well, this is given by this integral here. So our chi-square distribution is this with uh, new, this, this uh, new, new degrees of freedom. So we have our probability density function for chi-squared. So, well, all we need to know is we can use this and look up tables for chi-squared to, to calculate p-values. Okay. And, yeah, there's no simple expression for the cumulative distribution function for chi-squared. So just a quick look at some chi-squared distributions. So cumulative distribution on the left and the probability density function on the right. So as we see, the, the degrees of freedom increases. This CDF becomes closer to being normally distributed and more symmetric. So as, N, as the number of degrees of freedom nu tends to infinity, this approaches a standard normal distribution. And we, yeah, we have the two, two first moments of this. So expectation is new and the variance is too new. Okay. So similarly that we did with uh, the other distributions, so the, the, the Z and the T, we can define quantiles of uh, chi-square distribution. So just in, in the same way, probability of x greater than this particular quantile of chi-squared equals 1 minus alpha. But we have to remember that chi-squared is not symmetric. So that you don't just look at um, one level and then a flip for the... So in, this, in the t and in the normal distribution, you can just look at one tail and the other tail is just a negative of that. So we have to be careful there to, when we're considering confidence intervals for the chi-square distribution. So you have to calculate both sides. Okay. So we've seen this before. We have this uh, chi-square distribution of our uh, sample variance scale. So we can use the same method as before to derive this confidence interval. So we have this probability of this expression here between these two uh, quantiles of chi-squared is equal to 1 minus alpha, where alpha is the same as before, say 5%. And we just rearrange this, and we have, that, we have a confidence interval for our population variance. OK, and we just calculate these through the chi-squared tables of MATLAB, whatever. Okay. So we have a confidence interval. So similarly to 
when we talked about confidence intervals with the sample mean, we can also conduct hypothesis testing on the sample on the variance. So we can say null hypothesis that the population variance is equal to a specific uh, variance, so sigma squared, sigma zero squared, and against an alternative hypothesis that it's not equal to this value, or one-sided test. Same as we looked at before, we're just looking at, we're just plugging in chi-squared values. And we have a decision rule of rejecting the null hypothesis if S squared is outside of this confidence interval. Or we can calculate p-values. Exactly the same. OK. OK. Let's look at the third set of notes. So in this set of notes, we're going to introduce some statistical models and then work through some properties to finally discuss about some decision theory from a frequentist and a Bayesian perspective. Okay. So we're just looking at univariate models here, so one random variable. And a very widely used and popular family of distributions is this so-called exponential family, which includes many of the distributions that you will have heard of. So normal, beta, gamma, exponential, wish chart, inverse wish chart, categorical, uh, Poisson, many, many, many. Okay, and all of these distributions take this general form. Okay, so and the exponential family of distributions is any distribution, either discrete, continuous, or a mixed type of mixed distribution that can be represented in this form. So we have this density function, probability density function, is equal to the exponential, and then we have four functions, d, e, g, h, which are known functions, which all have the same form for each of the y, i. So our random variables are y here, yeah, so y i to n. OK. So this is the general form. And a popular subclass of this uh, family is called the natural form, which takes this, this um, parameterization here. So e to the theta y i plus b theta, OK. And then we have this extra dispersion parameter, uh, phi, here in the denominator. And then we have this other function, c. OK. So may maybe this isn't uh, quite, this isn't so clear to just look at S straight, just, just look at and think how, what kind of distributions are we, are we talking about? How does this relate to, say, the normal distribution? or Bernoulli. OK. So we'll, we'll, come, we'll show that. And here, theta is the, the canon, canonical or natural parameter for our random variable y. OK. So this natural form, this dispersion function that enters into the natural form, allows a lot more flexibility in terms of the, the yi can be, they, they need to be independent, but they don't necess necessarily be, have to be identically distributed across the, uh, the n, so y1 to n. So this, this, create, this means it's a very flexible class of probability models, and you, this is used widely in many aspects of machine learning. So if you want to see a nice paper on some details. It's, it's quite brief, but some details and enough details to understand how this all comes together in terms of the exponential family and some of the most important members that you'll be interested in. There's a nice paper by Clark and Thayer, well, a primer on the exponential family of distributions, 2004, I think. Okay, so maybe you want to have a look at that. <clears throat> 
But for the remainder of this section, we're going to consider a simplified version of this natural form, which takes this parameterization here. So we have a density function of y with our parameter vector theta of uh, natural parameters, or canonical, is equal to h of y, some function of the data, multiplied by g of theta, which normalizes the distribution to equal to 1. It's here, it's because, of course, this, this is the probability density function. So you want this to integrate to 1. Uh, multiplied by some exponential with uh, parameters multiplied by some function of y. OK, so th this is a, just a simplified form of the natural a simplified form of the natural form of the exponential family. OK, okay. so there's also a, a slide here on. So there's a different possible pr uh, par parameterizations of this, uh, uh, this exponential family. And if you look in David Barber's machine learning book, the pink one, uh, the Bayesian reasoning and machine learning, I think it's called, uh, then you'll see this, this parameterization. OK, I'm not going to go through that. OK. So some general properties of the exponential family. So let's look as an example, first example at the Bernoulli distribution. So tossing a coin, Bernoulli distribution. So we want to, so here we have the Bernoulli distribution, so random variables y and the probability of success. So probability of a head is alpha, this parameter alpha. So this is the probability density function for this discrete Bernoulli distribution. So we want to see how this plays out and how this can be transformed to this exponential form that we looked at here, this particular simplified form. So if we just do some shuffling around and some transformations, we can see that if we take a, an exponential here and then introduce some logs, and then take this 1 minus alpha out, then we see that we have this form, which is in the simplified form that we, have, we, we looked at before. So we see that theta is this uh, logistic logistic sigmoid function, so 1 over 1 plus e to the minus alpha, which is this uh, logistic function. And then we have simply that u, is, u of y is just y, h of y is 1, and this g of theta is equal to this sigmoid function of negative alpha. OK, so this is a really simple example for the Bernoulli. And then there's this similar it's a similar approach to see how uh, all of your favorite distributions can be represented in this uh, exponential form. So how t we can see how all of these distributions are members of this exponential family. So some examples of discrete members of the exponential distribution. So we have Bernoulli, which we just looked at, binomial, multinomial, Poisson, Dirichlet. OK, so what would you use? some of these distributions for. So typically a binomial distribution, which just is just a sequence of independent Bernoulli trials. So say flipping a coin 10 times would be a, bin a binomial distribution. So what's the probability distribution of the number of successes of this coin flipping? And this is, can be extended to a multinomial model. So say rolling a die, maybe uh, n times. So 10 times, so there's k possible outcomes, so six possible outcomes with probabilities. If it's a fair die, then p1 to pk are all one on six. Um, but of course, uh, any possibilities here. And then you have n trials, so rolling 10 times. Okay. So this is a multinomial model. And then a Poisson model, which you'd use to model the the probability of a number of events which would occur in a fixed time interval. So, uh, for example, the number of 
telephone calls you receive in the next hour at an exchange. And then we have this uh, Dirichlet model, which is used quite a lot in, uh, in machine learning, which is a, a general multivariate generalization of the beta distribution. Uh, and also it's, useful, it's a conjugate prior, which I'll, I'll discuss next, of the categorical distribution and the multinomial distribution. So this is why it's a, a nice model to consider. Uh, so this returns the belief that uh, the probability of k different events are uh, y i, given that each event uh, is observed this uh, alpha i minus one times. Okay. So that was discrete distributions. So there's also many continuous members of the exponential family. So simply the Gaussian version, which we've been talking about quite a lot so far, um, inverse normal, exponential, Laplace, beta, gamma. Okay, there's many, many. Uh, so yeah, exponential model, maybe you'd use to describe the time be between events, so inter-arrival times. So for example, uh, radioactive decay, um, time until the next phone call you receive, uh, credit modeling, etc. And we have a beta model, which is useful as a prior uh, on a, a zero one random variable, so a probability. And then also this gamma model, which we looked at just before, this gamma distribution, which is sometimes used as a distribution for failure times. So component, electrical, electronic component failure times, and light bulbs, or anything. Okay. So some examples there of the exponential family of models. So we have our data sample, uh, y1 to n, and we want to select the optimal parameter. We want to estimate the parameter theta. So we can view this probability function, so this sampling model, sampling model distribution, uh, f y1 to n, given our parameter of interest theta, or our parameter vector, which we don't know, uh, as a function of theta. So when we do this, this is, this is known as the likelihood function. So this L of our theta vector of parameters given our data. So that's the this notation here is just probability of y1 to n given theta. But it's, it's written in this form to, to represent the likelihood. So typically, when we want to optimize the parameter vector theta, we, want to we can take this maximum likelihood estimator, which is just maximizing this likelihood function that we have here. So that'd be the, uh, the typical approach in a kind of uh, frequentist approach. But also there, there's another approach, a Bayesian approach that we can look at. Okay, so first let's look at a general expression for this maxim maximum likelihood for the exponential family we're, we're talking about. Okay. So this upside down triangle here, this nabla or delta, however you want to call that. So this delta with a subscript theta. So this is uh, the gradient vector. So what we're doing here, we want to optimize this likelihood function by using Okay, I'm not, well, I'm not gonna talk about optimization methods, but we want to optimize this uh, likelihood function by looking at the derivatives. So say in a simple uh, one-dimensional example, just uh, um, simplest possible example you can 
think of. We want to find this, this theta hat, where this is the likelihood function. OK. So this is our likelihood function, which is just the probability of seeing this data given that the parameters are equal to this theta. OK, so this is our likelihood function. Um, we want to find this, this value of theta. So I'm not talking about optimization methods, but here if we just look at the gradient, whichever, we find out the gradient, we, I mean, we know that at, at this local optimal, local optimum point, that we know that the gradient is equal to zero. This is just the gradient vector, but in this case, it's a uh, one-dimensional gradient vector. OK. So all we want to find out is this local optimum. Well, we want to find a global optimum, really, but and in, in this case, it is because it's just a, a quadratic function ex in that example. But OK, let's not get into that. But what we're saying is we want to find this maximum likelihood estimator of theta. So if we take, if we look at a gradient vector, which here for this exponential family, we just take this gradient function here of the, let's go back. Okay, here. If we just differentiate this with respect to the theta vector, then what we get is here. So these terms. OK. And then we do some algebra, uh, shuffling around in some algebra, and we get to this term. So negative delta g theta is equal to this expectation of u in here. OK. So that's maximum likelihood. But what if we want to include, so that's, that's a frequentist approach. So if we want to take a Bayesian approach, and um, perhaps we want to include some kind of prior knowledge or some previous experience of many experiments we've conducted before, some, uh, some expert domain knowledge, and we want to include some prior beliefs. OK, so if we look back at Bayes' theorem, we call Bayes' theorem. Um, we see this posterior. On the left, we have this posterior distribution. So the probability distribution of our vector of parameters, given our data, is equal to our likelihood here. So the probability of the data given uh, our parameters multiplied by this this term here, which is the prior, this p of theta. So here, we're injecting into the model some kind of prior belief about what theta can be. So maybe we have some good idea of what this parameter could be from, as I say, from previous knowledge or, I mean, also, I mean, even if you don't have some particularly strong views here, you can put quite a, a flat distribution uh, on this and then it kind of equates to uh, the previous approach of not really putting a, inputting a prior. OK, so this is the prior. We can make some choice. We need to make some choice about this, this p of theta. And then we have this um, normalization on the bottom, this evidence probability of y. OK. Yeah. OK, yeah, just oh, so uh, hyperparameters. So this p of theta uh, can also will also depend on some hyperparameters which which aren't included in theta. Okay. So we don't we don't need to think about that once we look at our priors. Mm -hmm. Then under this framework of Bayesian estimation, we make our inferences about theta using our posterior distribution, so the term on the left. So the probability of theta given our data set y1 to n, which, I mean, we, we can 
s clearly see how this all comes together. So if we just use some uh, probability, um, conditional probability axioms, we see that this term on the left is just the probability of y and theta divided by probability of y. Uh, and we can, we can work through this as the denominator being the integral of probability of y and theta over theta to get probability of y. And we can see how this all plays out to be likelihood, prior, and then this normalization con uh, term on the bottom. So this is how we calculate this in practice. So you, you have to sum, up, sum out all of these thetas. OK, example. So a Gaussian distribution, so normal distribution, which is very common and widely used in machine learning and all other, uh, many other practical applications. Okay. So this, we consider this Gaussian likelihood distribution on our data Y, which has this familiar form here. And then for our prior distribution for theta, so the probability distribution of this theta, theta vector, um, uh, we, we assume takes this normal distribution. So centered around theta, uh, centered around mu, and with this, this variance term here, which has been in, this, in these notes, has been denoted with the tau tau squared for the variance of theta. So we want to be able to, when we multiply these two terms together, we want to result, we want the result to be something nice to deal with. And this, this kind of niceness property uh, is called conjugacy. When you multiply two uh, well, you multiply a likelihood function by a prior distribution, and your result is the distribution of the likelihood function, so the same family of distributions. So here we, we are multiplying uh, normal and the normal, and the posterior model is normal. So that's good. That's what we want, because there's, there's a reason we want to use normals, normal distributions, uh, and that's because they're really nice to deal with, have many uh, useful properties and, and close form solutions for estimation and, uh, and for simulation. OK, so we end up with this posterior model here with these two terms, mu and the, the mean and the variance. OK, but how did, how did we get to that? OK, maybe it's useful to have a, a look through the steps. OK. OK, so we consider our Y1 to N, IID, Gaussian observations. OK, and we have our prior distribution here. OK, so this, this first term is the likelihood uh, density function, so the likelihood function. So we're the IID, our data samples, our N data samples are IID. So to get the likelihood function, we can just multiply each individual so this is this product term here, one to n. It's just we're just multiplying each individual density function for yi. Multiply them together because there's no dependent structure here, completely uh, independent. Uh, so we just take a product there. Okay. So here this this is means we're posterior is proportional. So we're ignoring the denominator in this term, uh, this denominator here. We don't need to consider that because that's just a, a normalization constant. We want, it does, doesn't play any role in showing what we want to show here that we end up with a normal distribution on the top. Okay. And then we have the term on the right, which is the prior distribution on theta. So we say, let's, we know that we think that it's, well, the prior distribution is a, a subjective approach, so a, a belief. So we have some kind of belief that theta lies 
in this range, well, theta takes this distribution. So it has a mean of mu here and this tau squared variance. Okay, so we multiply these together and we can see that these terms all kind of collect nicely. Uh, well, yeah, so we, we get rid of this uh, multiplying term at the start and then we see it collects nicely in terms of this exponential here. And we do some algebra and some move around some terms and we end up with this line at the bottom. And then multiply, yeah, okay. We don't really need to go through all of these steps, but maybe you can look through, through the notes to just familiarize yourself with how we end up with this normal distribution with these specific mu and uh, variants at the end. Okay. So maybe some, some fun, fun algebra to work through. Um, yeah. So we end up with this posterior distribution here. And then you can see how we have these mu and sigma squared terms here. So we have this posterior mean given by this term and a posterior variance. Okay, and so an important point here is that we see as we gather more and more and more data, we see that the, the data mean dominates the prior mean. So what do we mean by that? we see that as n increases, as n tends to infinity or increases, we see that uh, this, the mean of the data, so here, this uh, y bar term on the right, I don't know if that's big enough to see for you, but basically, as we gather more and more data, the, the posterior mean becomes the data mean, and the prior mean doesn't play any or very small role in that. So this, I mean, this is a, a useful property because if we have more and more data, then we should believe what the data says rather than what our subjective beliefs were before we gathered data. So I think that's a useful property. Okay, so some common conjugate models for discrete likelihoods. So if our likelihood is this particular model on the left, so for, for example, a Bernoulli distribution is our likelihood function, then if we use a beta prior, then we end up with a beta posterior. Okay, so that's... That's uh, what we wanted. And similarly for all of these distributions, and we can see what the mean, well, the parameters become. So there's prior A and B, and then we, it's quite a simple change in there. This should be uh, Dirichlet. Okay. And also for continuous likelihoods. Uh, so for example, if we wanted to look at the uh, covariance of a multivariate normal, uh, then we would use uh, an inverse Wishart distribution for the prior, and we'd get a pros uh, posterior, which is inverse Wishart with these, this parameter combination. <coughs> okay, yeah, and um, yeah, you can see all the rest there. So gamma as well, so quite simple. Okay, so properties of conjugate models. So why, why is this property, why is this idea of conjugacy, conjugacy useful? So we, if we don't have this conjugacy property, property the posterior can be, can take a, a kind of nasty form which isn't useful or it's very difficult to deal with. So we want this conjugacy property so we have this kind of closed form or uh, such that we can calculate some kind of moments, such so the mode or moments quantiles, tail thickness or some kind of dependent structure is all, would all drop out analytically if we have, if we construct our uh, prior and our likelihood, if we use conjugate pairs 
So it's an important, consider very important consideration to make when uh, carrying out some Bayesian modeling. Uh, and also uh, sampling, anal uh, analytic sampling, which is of course uh, going to be uh, cheaper uh, from the posterior is uh, available in this closed form if we have a nice conjugate pair and a nice distribution. Where, okay. So this is very valuable if you're running lots of uh, simulation. You want to sample, sample many times. So Monte Carlo uh, estimates of integrals, for example, where you just generate lots and lots of data examples and say take an average to take, uh, generate this uh, sample mean. Okay. So it can be a very valuable uh, property. Okay. Okay. So we looked at some, we looked at point estimators from a frequency, a frequentist point of view. Now we're talking about a Bayesian perspective. And from a Bayesian perspective, uh, point estimators, we're, we're, we're considering the posterior distribution. So we, beforehand, we, before we look at the data, we set out our prior distribution of our parameters, theta, and then we collect data, uh, calculate our likelihood function, and then we have our posterior distribution. Um, we want to perform some kind of, we want to perform estimation of parameters and then some kind of model selection. So we need to carry out estimation of uh, point estimators. So typically you, you could use uh, some kind of uh, minimization of mean square error, so MMSE on the posterior mean, or what's called this, this map estimate, which is a maximum a posteriori uh, estimation uh, and also evaluation of the evidence for each model. Okay, so here's this, these three uh, approaches are set out here. So the MMSC is just simply an integral over the, the probability of probability distribution, so this uh, posterior multiplied by theta. And then we have the map estimate is just uh, arg max over theta, so maximizing this probability given our models mi over our choices of theta. Okay. And similarly for the evidence of uh, model i. So the probability of seeing our data set, so we have our sample, what's the probability of seeing this sample given that the model that generated the sample is, for example, model one, model two, model three. Okay. These are our point estimates. Okay. All right. Okay. So. Okay. So classical model selection from a frequentist perspective. This is what we, we've been looking at for most of uh, what we talked about, the frequentist perspective. And a, a classical approach to selecting which model is appropriate is using this kind of, this hypothesis testing approach. So we state a null hypothesis, H0, and our alternative. Okay. So we've looked at lots of this. And then we calculate an appropriate test statistic, so T, using our data. Um, we compute the, the p-value. Okay, and then we say if, what's, if the probability of the, this test statistic is more extreme than uh, this T, this is our p-value. Okay. And then we take an action based on if this p-value is less than, say, 5%, or some kind of pre-specified type 1 error, some alpha. Uh, 
and then we reject H0 if it's lower. Okay, that's our action. Okay, so there's lots. So in the the development and the history of statistics, this this was the kind of classical approach to model selection. But there's limitations to this approach. And the first is that it can only be applied in a, a simple manner uh, when the the two hypotheses are nested. So one with another, uh, one contains another. So such so. The null hypothesis must be a simplified form of the alternative, okay, in terms of the model. Okay, so, uh, yeah, for example, uh, one model parameter is a constant in, in the model. However, in many applications we're interested in, we want to consider non-nested models. So for example, model one is quadratic and model two is an exponential. They're not nested and we want to, we want to decide between these models which is, which is more appropriate for our data, which is the, a better model for our data. Um, and furthermore, so classical tests only evidence against the null, so rejects or don't reject the null, where we use the p-value to indicate this, this extreme, uh, extreme value of our sample, which shows how much evidence there is to reject the null. Okay, but that's for a small p-value. If we have a large p-value, then this doesn't necessarily tell us anything. It doesn't say the two models are equivalent. It just says there's a lack of evidence to reject H0. Okay, which may sound like the same thing, but it's not the same thing. Um, one is reject or don't reject. It's not reject or accept. Okay, so that's kind of crucial to remind yourself of when you're doing hypothesis testing. And also this p-value doesn't, it's, there's no interpretation in terms of evidence or weight of evidence uh, as, a, as a probability. So if you repeat, repeat, then there's no, there's, there's no direct interpretation. Okay. So that was the classical approach to model selection. How, now we want to consider a Bayesian model selection approach. And then this came about in the 60s, we're starting with the, there's a, starting with the Jeffries in 61, uh, with a, a Bayesian hypothesis testing. So this uh, gets around these problems we've discussed in the classical model selection. So basically what we're talking about, so given our data, uh, it, we, apply Bayes' theorem and compute a posterior probability that hypothesis one is correct. And in this framework, there's no limitation on the number of hypotheses we can consider, whereas before we would consider null or uh, H1. Here, we can there's no limitation. And there's no requirement for the hypotheses to be nested, the model one and model zero to be nested, which is, crucial for what many applications you want to look at. Okay, so for this reason, the notations switch between null hypothesis alternative to this notation of uh, model one to M. Okay, let's look at a simple version. So this, we have two models, M1 and M2, for our data Y. Okay, and we have respective parameter vectors, theta1, theta2. Okay, so we have our prior densities, P of theta i for these two uh, models, and we can obtain the marginal distributions of Y by just simply integrating out these parameters of 
theta, the theta parameters. So we integrate our density functions. So this function of y given theta and given the model um, multiplied by our probability, this prior distribution here. So we just integrate out over theta. And we, we have this probability of seeing the data given that model one generated the data or given that model two generated the data. And once we have this, we can apply Bayes' theorem. So we have uh, a posterior model probability. So here, we have this probability of model one given the data set, or probability of model two given the data set. And we want to see which model is more probable, okay? So we have what's called a Bayes factor. So Bayes factor is given by this expression here. So the posterior, the ratio of the posterior probabilities, so P M1 over Y, uh, P M1 given Y divided by P M2 given Y, and then normalized by this, the prior distributions across the, the models. Okay, so this is the base factor, which you can use, use to decide between model one and model two. And yeah, this, these term, this posterior term, this is just expanding out this posterior term to be, use, yeah, well, using Bayes' theorem to be likelihood prior evidence. So you end up with this term here. So we have the ratio of the observed marginal densities for the two models. So if we assume that a priori, so before we have no, uh, no particular subjective feelings that model one is more likely than model two, then we say probability, prior probabilities of models, model one, model two is the same. Then we can see that if we just plug, plug that into this bottom section here, the denominator here, then that's just equal to one on the bottom. And we have this the base factor just becomes the posterior odds of model one. Okay. So let's look a little example. So if we have here two models and we have the same parameterization, so the theta vector is the same for both models. So we can have uh, a hypothesis that, uh, yeah, okay, both hypotheses are simple, right? The first model, theta equals theta one, theta equals theta two, so simple. Same, same uh, theta. Then we see that uh, the base factor is equal to this, the PDF, the density function of y given theta, the density function of y given theta two, okay? which is just the likelihood ratio. So this term here, we see, just drops out to be the likelihood ratio because the priors are equal on the, the model. Because the, the vector theta is the same, the priors are equal, so this just becomes the likelihood ratio. And of course, you just, there's lots of, uh, if you're not performing Bayesian analysis, then you just maybe you'd just be looking at some kind of likelihood ratio testing. So this, was, this is what this would look like. Okay. So in this simple versus simple setting, there's the base factor is just the odds in favor of model one over model two, just given the data, so no prior. So this is exactly what we consider in the frequent test approach. Okay, likelihood ratio. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the exponential family and uh, Bayesian model selection. So in this final section, we're gonna talk about decision theory um, from a frequentist and a Bayesian approach. So fundamental elements of decision theory. <clears throat> 
So we consider that everything we don't know as a decision maker is called the state of nature, which we're going to denote, which is typically denoted by this s, which this subscript, this uh, lowercase s, which comes, which takes values on this state space s. Okay, so for example, a single unknown quantity, so a parameter, or a vector of parameters. Okay, so we don't know that, but they're the state, so that's the state of nature. Okay, and then we make observations based on this state of nature. So we have our observation model. So we assume that our sample x uh, takes values on this large x. Okay, so just some notation being introduced here. Uh, where the, prob the PDF, the probability density function for this x is this f of x given s. Okay, so we take samples x and these samples are given the states of nature. Okay. Okay, so this probability function has different names in different communities. So in the pattern recognition community, this is called uh, clash con conditional probability function. Okay. So yeah, in uh, pattern recognition, this, these samples x uh, are called features. Okay, so just uh, different names for exactly the same thing across different sets of researchers or different communities. Uh, um, for exactly the same thing. Okay, uh, whereas if, you, if you're in the signal processing uh, community, for example, then you would refer to this as an observational model. As, uh, if you're in the statistical uh, world, then you'd prob you're probably going to call this parametric statistical model or just likelihood function. Okay, so you, yeah, you get this a lot across related and overlapping fields. Okay, yes. so some fundamental elements of decision theory. So this concept of a decision rule. So we have a goal of taking a decision, which is we make some observations and we want to look at these observations, do some kind of statistical inference, and then use that to take an action amongst a set A of actions that we can possibly take or decisions we can take. Okay. So we, we have this notation here for a decision rule. So a decision rule is this delta function, this delta of, of our observations x, which maps x into our actions. Okay, observe x, take a decision to this action A. And yeah, this, this capital D is the set of allowed decisions. Right, so how, how do we make decisions? So to quantify this whole process and framework of making decisions based on observations, we introduce what's called a loss function. So this function L, which maps uh, states, of, states of the world, so states of nature and our actions, so this uh, two-dimensional space to some kind of uh, number, some real, real number. So what's the real state of nature? We take an action. What's the, what's the loss associated with that? So this is a kind of negative approach to, uh, to thinking about it. So we want to, well, typically, you, you want to minimize the loss associated uh, with taking an action. Okay. Yeah. And then there's various choices of, of loss function you can, you can look at. But we're not going to go into too much detail on that. But it doesn't necessarily have to be 
a real number. It can just be, say, uh, positive or 0, 1. Okay. And then there's a slightly more optimistic perspective, uh, which is in terms of the language used or the, well, the approach is just the flip approach, um, where we consider a utility function rather than a loss function. So this is the, the standard approach in uh, economics or uh, the business literature. So rather than thinking about uh, a loss, we just talk about a utility function. So how much we're going to gain. So, of course, you can see that this is just a negative sign. A loss is equal to negative, positive, negative utility. Okay. So, a summary of this, these, this core, the core foundations of decision theory. So, we, it's a, prob a statistical problem which we formalize with these elements we discussed here. So we have our states of nature, our actions, our x, which is our random uh, variable, our variable, which is drawn from x, our loss function, and then we have our decisions, and then we have our density function of our random variable given the states of nature, the real states of nature. And um, we want we solve this problem. We want to solve this problem by taking the decision which is, in some sense, optimal for the problem. So, optimal perhaps is maximum utility or minimum loss. So, from a pre frequentist perspective, the state of nature which of course we don't know, is assumed always to be the same. So no, no prior here. So this is frequentist. So S is assumed to be deterministic, and, but we don't know it. And then we see that the observations are generated through this likelihood function that we have. And then we take a decision, optimal decision, based on how well this will perform if we repeat, repeat, repeat the experiment, which in most cases is, is not the case. We only, in, well, in, most, in many cases, we only get to take a decision once and then uh, see, the, see the loss or utility gained. Okay. So to formalize this, we have our loss function, our decision rule delta, and then we have this risk function. So a frequentist risk function, which is the average loss. So we have R, which is a frequentist risk function. It's just our expected loss given our action, uh, expected loss of, our, of taking our action, our decision, given that we have given that S. OK. And then these are the two equivalent forms for a continuous and discrete. Okay, so we can see that. Okay, so there's different, many different choices we can think about when taking a decision. Here, and a popular choice that we, that's, uh, a popular choice in this kind of framework is this idea of a minimax risk. So the, the general idea is that we want to minimize the worst case scenario. So minimize the maximum risk. Okay, so if we look at this uh, a little more formally, this is the infimum, infimum over the decisions. So infimum when our delta is a member of our decision space of our supremum, so S is a member of our states of, states of the world, states of nature, of this risk function that we looked at here. So minimize the maximum expected risk. Okay. 
And typically, I mean, if we're just, if we're just looking at closed sets of uh, decisions and states of the world, then this is just minimum and maximum. So this is just when we're considering continuous spaces. Okay, so quite a simple idea, minimizing the maximum risk, which uh, is probably quite intuitive to, to think about. You want to minimize the worst possible situation. Um, and also from a game theory point of view, um, where one of the, where you are the decision maker and the other players then is nature. So nature tries to choose a state S such that it's the maximum possible average loss. So maximum risk to you. To you. Yeah. And you're the decision maker and you know that nature is trying to is trying to impose on you a situation with maximum risk. So you take a decision, uh, you take a decision which minimizes this risk in the worst possible case. Okay. But this is not always guaranteed to, uh, to exist, this kind of, this minimax decision, depending on how your uh, decision, your problem is set up. Okay, so that was a, a frequentist perspective on decision theory. So now if we consider a, a Bayesian approach. So as before, we have, with a Bayesian approach, we have this a priori knowledge. So some kind of subjective view of what the states of nature are in or the probability function of states of nature. Okay, so we want to use this, this knowledge somehow, inject this into the decision-making process. Yeah. Okay, so here we note that why would we possibly want to use this kind of Bayesian perspective? So we, we note that in a frequentist based approach, there's some situations where it's clearly not, it doesn't, it's not intuitive. It doesn't really, it doesn't make sense to use this kind of frequentist thinking about the world. So a, a typical example is that the unknown state of nature is, um, present is the presence or absence of some decision in a patient, okay? We have to decide whether to operate or not operate. Um, but of course, there's no randomness involved in whether the patient has the disease or doesn't have the disease in this clear-cut example. So either the patient has, an, has the disease or the patient doesn't, has the, doesn't have the disease. Um, but we want to uh, make a decision based on this. So a statement such as there's a 75% chance that the patient has a disease doesn't have any interpretation in a frequentist world. So you can't repeat this experiment many times this, for the same patient. So this idea, of, this Bayesian idea of subjective belief that there's 75% chance of the patient having a disease is the only way the only way to think about this kind of problem. So it's put simply it's a, expresses a degree of belief or a state a state of knowledge. So quantifying your personal beliefs in this particular uh, patient has a disease or not. Okay. So we assume here we have a set of beliefs, some available knowledge based on prior experience, um, some kind of expert, expert domain knowledge or something that gives us some, some kind of idea of what this uh, state of nature distribution could be. Okay, 
So we have, here's our prior. The notation here we're going to use is this small p of this s of s. Okay. So, yeah, we stress here that the prior is, you think of your prior before you look at your data, if you're, if you're a, a proper Bayesian. Okay. Um, but so you want to combine your data and your prior and then take a decision. So we have this decision space, this decision problem here, which is similar to what we were looking at before, but just with the addition of this prior distribution we want to add in. So we want to take a decision. We want to map X to A, take some decision. Okay. And we want to do it in an optimal fashion. So we saw that in the frequentist approach, we have this frequentist risk. So the risk, uh, when we average loss over all the possible uh, observations, uh, ignoring the specific observation that we have, and then take a decision. So this is the risk associated. So this, we call this frequentist risk. And the disadvantage that we have is that it does, it, it depends on the unknown state of nature and it, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, induce this ordering that we want on a, a set of allowed decision rules. Okay. So from a Bayesian perspective, we have this posterior expected loss function here. So which is the expectation over S of this loss function given our observation X. Okay, and we can see how our prior function comes into this uh, expression here, the continuous and discrete. Whereas before, we just had this. We just had this uh, frequentist risk function here. Okay, now we have this posterior expected loss. So expectation, so integral of this loss function multiplied by this uh, P or the, the uh, discrete sum. Okay. So here, so this is the posterior. Okay. And similar to before, uh, all the way through, just Bayes theorem everywhere, just uh, obtained via Bayes theorem. So likelihood prior and an evidence on the bottom, so where this evidence is just the integral of these. So let's just crop this crops up all the time. Okay. So then we have the that the criterion for choosing a decision, so selecting a decision or evaluating a decision is this a posteriori expected loss function, this P, PS. Okay. Um, and yeah, so we don't have to worry about this dependence on X here because every time we take a decision, we have, the, we have an observation X available. So this is the crucial difference between Bayesian and frequentist approaches. So in the frequentist risk function, we average over all possible observations. Whereas in the Bayesian framework, this a posteriori expected loss is a function of the particular observation realized. Okay. And then finally, we have the optimal Bayes decision, which is uh, minimizing this expected, lo expected loss, a posteriori expected loss. Okay. So that's kind of intuitive. We just minimize over all possible decisions we can take this loss function uh, for any observation that we, that we arrive at. Okay. So we have Bayes risk. Uh, 
So to, it, to evaluate our decision rule in our Bayesian framework, we we look at this uh, integrated risk here, this R. So this is, this is just the frequentist risk, risk uh, average with respect to this unknown state of nature. So of course we don't know the state of nature, S. So we integrate over this space S, um, the R here, which is the half from before, yeah, this frequentist risk function. So we just integrate over our uh, unknown states of nature uh, multiplied by this uh, P of S here. And so if we expand that out, we can see how this, uh, we can see how this is calculated over the double integral over the two spaces, uh, the state of nature space and the observation space. And we can just see how this is the loss function and the likelihood function and the prior function. Okay. I mean, see how, how P, okay. And we, this is just notation here where the PX of S is just equal to this likelihood and then uh, a prior. Okay. Um, and finally, some properties of the Bayes risk. So, Bayes risk, it produces a real number. So this isn't a function of the states or uh, the, the sample X for each decision rule. Thus we can, we can get this total or ordering of a set of decision rules. So we can compare our decision rules directly, which is a nice feature. Um, and so we can choose a decision. And finally, the a posteriori expected loss and the Bayes risk are equivalent. So you get the same decision regardless of which approach you take here. The, if you just look, if you work through and calculate from the Bayes risk or if you use the a posteriori expected loss. Okay, and uh, that's the end of the slides, is it? It's quite early. So has anyone got any questions based on any of this uh, um, that we talked about today, or maybe hypothesis testing from before. No? Crystal clear. No sections you want to have a look at again. Dajobu. Okay. Thank you for your attention.